Hello fellow engineers, welcome again and today is 20th of February 2018 and it's also the last video of our web series which is focused on front end system engineering for radio astronomy and it's a nice occasion to conclude our web series on 20th February itself because we started our web series on 15th of September which is celebrated as an engineers day in India while 20th of February is celebrated as Science Day in India in memory of and to honor the work of Nobel laureate Sir C. V. Raman and for his discovery of Raman effect of X-ray scattering. So coming back to our conclusion video of the web series, uh, I was thinking what to talk in this very last video. and. Obviously, which came in my mind to talk about is the overall system performance of the front end when it is mounted in particular single dish radio telescope. In our web series, we have covered the development of each and every subsystem the, of the entire front end system. We talked about choke horn, we talked about polarizers, we talked about low noise amplifiers and also corresponding filter banks, noise injection, etc. So now as such our system is ready and the question to answer is how well this system would perform for observing a particular radio star and what is the figure of merit while specifying such system. Naturally to specify the system one has to consider both the specification of the front end system as well as the specifications of the reflector antenna. So in this video, we will try to cover a system figure of merit referred as gain over TCIS or G by TCIS commonly used in radio astronomy instrumentation jargon. What it is, what are, what are the exact numbers of G by TCIS, etc. and how it is calculated. So to start with, let's have a look at the screen. What we have on the screen is a single dish radio telescope. What I have made is a very generic picture of a single dish radio telescope where we have a parabolic dish which receives the signal from space and focus it at the focal point where our choke horn or any horn antenna is placed and after the horn antenna it's the rest of the front end system. There are some support struts in the system to hold our front end and then usually such dish is mounted on an antenna pedestal which has the azimuth and elevation rotation assembly that is the antenna can be rotated in different directions in the sky in order to receive the signal from particular radio source. So to achieve or to calculate the G by TCIS for such complete system we have to look at the two aspects. One that is the gain of the dish or the effective area of the dish which depends upon your feed, the taper of the feed, the f by d ratio of your reflector, the surface accuracies of the reflector and so on. While the TCS that is the system temperature depends upon the noise picked up by the antenna from sky, from the ground, the noise generated inside the system, uh, the noise generated by low noise amplifier and so on. So let's start with the aperture efficiency or the effective area of a single dish radio telescope. For this of course I would consider a practical case because then you will get a, num get a feeling for the numbers and also the equations I have used. So let's assume my parabolic dish has a diameter of 15 meter and a focal length of 6 meter giving f over d ratio of 0.4 Blockage area that is the amount of area blocked by the feed system or by and by the support struts is of the order of 2 meter square and no dish in reality is like ideal paraboloid. So there, there will be some surface inaccuracies of the practically fabricated dish and I assume that these surface errors or the standard deviation of the surface error is of the order of 5 millimeter. And again, throughout our entire web series, we have talked about 
all these solutions in L band frequency range that is about 1 to 1.6 gigahertz. So let's stick with the classical radio astronomy frequency of 1420 megahertz as a sample calculation for G by T cis. So given this we could say that we know the diameter simply we could calculate the surface uh, not the surface area the aperture area and that is simply the area of the circle having a diameter of 15 meter and that comes about 177 meter square. But we cannot use this entire physical area for our observations. Why? We have already covered this in our chokehorn antenna that a chokehorn plus a dish would have an aperture efficiency and that depends upon the taper of the chokehorn far field radiation pattern as well as the spillover efficiency, illumination efficiency, phase efficiency and so on. So let's assume some practical numbers. Just the choke horn and ideal parabol paraboloid reflector with given f by d is giving me about 70% of aperture efficiency. Due to the blockage and the blockage of the struts, we, I am losing some 5% in efficiency more. And since my surface is not ideal, I will also have some loss due to the imperfections in the surface, which is about 2%. So that gives me a total efficiency of 70% multiplied by 1 minus 100 minus 5, that is 95%, multiplied by 100 minus 2, 98%, giving me an effective area just of the order of 115 square meters. So now you could have an idea that even though I have a dish with a collecting area of 176 meters square, the effective area I am going to use throughout through the my system is just 115 meters square. And now from this collecting area or the effective area of the dish, one could calculate the gain of the dish, one could calculate the beam width after the reflector and so on. But we will stick with the effective area terminology here because in radio astronomy it is more common to use effective area because the source power or the intensity of the source is often described in terms of flux of the source. I will talk about it a bit later in the video. In next slide what you will see that this particular antenna is looking at the sky in the direction of the source so there is a point source or somewhat extended source in the sky and on the background of the source there is noise coming from the sky and this noise at least in L band frequencies is dominantly by the cosmic microwave background radiation and the galactic background radiation. So the antenna even with the, with the, with the absence of source is going to look the sky background and it's going to receive some noise from the sky. Also if the antenna is tilted at lower elevations some part of antenna would also see the ground below it and it, it would also pick up the ground noise and this is because the ground is not at 0 kelvin temperature one could say that it's a gray body around 250 kelvin 260 kelvin and so on and then there is a thermal radiation coming out of the ground which would contribute to the noise of your system so the system temperature for single dish radio telescope is the noise picked up by the antenna and the noise of the receiver. So it's antenna temperature plus receiver temperature. And antenna temperature has two components. One is the pickup of sky noise, that is T sky, and one is pickup of ground noise, that is T ground. While the receiver temperature also has two dominating components. One is the noise due to the lossy part before the LNA, it could be a cable, it could be a filter, it could be a directional coupler and so on. While the most dominating factor for any receiver temperature is the noise temperature of the LNA. So this crude approximation is good enough to understand the mechanism of G by T cis of a single dish radio telescope. So now also look, let's have a look at some practical numbers on system temperature. <coughs> So now as you could see on the screen, the three-dimensional far field pattern of the 
reflector antenna is visible and naturally it has just one main lobe with a very very high gain but it also have lot of side lobes in different directions so whenever we use such a reflector antenna looking at some lower elevations all these higher side lobes they try to pick up the ground noise and that gets added to your system temperature then as a sample calculation we could say that the thesis which is the contribution due to all these different factors we could have say 20 kelvin noise picked up by the antenna when it is looking just at the sky which is a contribution of sky plus ground it could have 10 kelvin 20 kelvin noise just because of the cable which is inserted between your polarizer and lna in our system we have a cable we have a directional coupler so they contribute to the loss just as a safety margin, I have considered 0.3 dB loss as a loss from cable and directional coupler before LNA. We have already discussed just a 0.1 dB loss at, at room temperature adds 7 Kelvin to your system temperature. So 0.3 dB adds 21 Kelvin. And we have also covered in our low noise amplifiers noise temperature measurement video that the noise temperature of our low noise amplifier is of the order of 35 Kelvin. So the system noise temperature, considering all these aspects, comes to about 76 Kelvin. And the ratio, that is A effective by TCS, boils down to about 1.5 meter square per Kelvin. The A effective by TCS is a figure of merit, not only for single dish radio astronomy systems, but it is also a common figure of merit for many satellite communication systems because it gives a clear idea that what sort of signal to noise ratio one could expect given the A effective by TCS number. Naturally, the higher the number, greater is the sensitivity of your radio, radio telescope. To increase the effective area, of course, you have to de design a feed along with the reflector to maximize aperture efficiency. That is one possibility. Another possibility is to simply increase the size of your aperture that instead of 15 meter dish you would go for 20 meter dish or 40 meter dish and to lower the system temperature you have to minimize the losses in your systems before the LNA and you could also work hard to get down the noise temperature of your LNA below 35 Kelvin below 30 Kelvin at room temperature. The best case is to go for cryogenic LNAs, but that's completely another story, which is not the scope of this particular web series. So in the next slide, what we will try to do now is to take these numbers, which are more engineering numbers or engineers prefer to talk in this way and convert these numbers into the radio astronomy jargon because radio astronomer try to look at exactly the same thing but in somewhat different fashion. So what radio astronomers usually use in practice? They use a unit called as Jansky. This is this unit was in honor of Carl Jansky who discovered actually the galactic background in back in 1932 and it is somewhat strange unit but I will try to simplify. It is a really, really small amount of power, 10 to the power of minus 26 watts, if collected in an aperture area of 1 meter by 1 meter with a RF bandwidth of just 1 hertz. But this is a very common unit used in radio astronomy and they would like, the radio astronomers would like to have G, G by TCS expressed in per Jansky unit. So how to do that? Let's have a look. Usually a single dish radio telescope would often have a polarized receiver. So it means when it, we are observing an unpolarized source, half the power would end up in linear X or linear Y polarization or half the power would end up in left hand circularly polarized output of the system or right hand circularly polarized output of the system. In our case, we have a septum polarizer, so we have left hand and right hand circularly polarized output on the system. In either of the case, the gain for single dish radio telescope 
with respect to radio astronomy jargon is expressed as effective area divided by 2 this factor 2 comes from the fact that we are using a polarized receiver and kb that is the boltzmann constant multiplied by 10 raised to minus 26 and that comes from the definition of the unit one jansky so if i plug in my effective area which is 115 square meter or something as you have seen earlier in the video and do all these calculations the gain in radio astronomy jargon of my single dish radio telescope will, would come about 0.04 kelvin per jansky and we you have already seen how, how i have arrived to effective area of the radio telescope and from there you could calculate the gain in kelvin per jansky and then if I divide this gain, which has a unit Kelvin per Jansky divided by the system temperature, which is 76 Kelvin, I will get a number which is G by T C is expressed in terms of per Jansky. Uh, for an engineer, this is these numbers doesn't give a direct feeling of the quality of the system, but for radio astronomers, they are used to this kind of representation of G by T C is. And that is obvious because in radio astronomy, most of the sources are characterized in terms of the flux of the source expressed in the unit of Jansky. So, for example, popular sources such as Cygnus or Cassiopeia, they have fluxes in the range of say 1400 Jansky, 2000 Jansky in say L band region. So, I will try to do a simple calculation in the next slide. And the question to answer as an engineer, if I point after taking all these efforts in designing the front end system, taking a reflector antenna, mounting my front end system on the reflector antenna, if I point my radio telescope to particular radio source, how much signal I will receive? That is one question to answer, of course. And secondly, what would be the signal to noise ratio in this case? To answer both these questions, we need G by T C S expressed in units of per Jansky. So let's have a look in the next slide. I assume that my source has certain flux expressed in Jansky. So when my antenna is pointed exactly towards my source, the noise received by the source expressed as T source is a product of flux of the source multiplied by the gain of the telescope. This is one case. And in second case, if I point my telescope to some other region of the sky where the source is absent, I will simply receive the system noise at the output of my receiver. <clears throat> so the deflection, that is the amount of output from my system when I am pointing my telescope to the source, and the amount of output of my system when my, I'm pointing my radio telescope to some other region of the sky can be expressed as a ratio. When the telescope is on source, what we receive is the source noise plus the system noise that is from background, receiver, ground, etc. While my radio telescope is looking at some direction where the source is absent, I will simply receive the system noise at the output of my receiver, which will in in both cases, it will get amplified by the gain of my low noise amplifier and subsequent gain blocks. So if I then assume that I have a flux of 2000 Jansky from one particular radio source, if I do all the calculation, the noise temperature by the source would reach of the order of 83 Kelvin. My system temperature is 76 Kelvin. So then if I simply do a calculation and take a ratio in terms of dB, I would get a deflection of 3.2 dB. This is why the G by T C S and its expression in terms of per Jansky unit is important for radio astronomy receivers. So given the source flux and with the knowledge of G by T C S of the radio telescope, single dish radio telescope, then it becomes easier to predict how much deflection we will see at the output of the system. And vice versa, if I know the G by T C S of my radio telescope very well, then in reverse fashion, I could try to predict 
the flux density of the radio source which I am about to observe. So with this I believe uh, you got a fair idea how a single dish radio telescope works, what the front end system engineering really means in radio astronomy perspective. We have also walked you through to the each and every stage of the front end system all the way from electromagnetics to low noise amplifiers to the filter banks and so on. We have also covered in this web series what is the effect of blockages due to the struts and blockages due to the feed with respect to prime focus paraboloid reflectors. So if you wish to develop a really competitive front-end system for radio astronomy, you could always reach us at consult at tantrayut.in. Till then, see you.